Hi! Back when I was working on making my 1890s waiter's jacket, I said this. Now, normally jackets like this would be lined with some sort of pretty or brightly colored silk. That just felt kind of excessive to me, and I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't have afforded that. So I just got this uh, cotton sateen from Mill End. I actually originally got a different kind of cotton sateen, but I decided that I liked that too much to use it as a lining. So I got this one instead and I bought that other cotton sateen and then I went back a little bit later and bought all of the rest of that cotton sateen. So I'm gonna be having a project made out of that later. But for purposes of linings, I'm using this kind of gray cotton sateen. Just a cameo appearance of the other cotton sateen that I bought that will soon become a dress. I just think that is such a beautiful fabric. This fabric reminded me heavily of this Lumiere Brothers video of a woman feeding pigeons, which was shot in Venice in 1896. If I get a copyright strike for showing a video that is 125 years old, I swear to God, I will be annoyed. The dress in the video is most likely made out of silk, probably silk satin, maybe silk taffeta, whereas mine is going to be made out of cotton sateen. This is historically accurate, however. Cotton sateen, or mercerized cotton as it is also called, was invented in 1844. The weaving process was then improved in 1890, and that's the version that we still use today. So, the original plan was to make a dress that was at least similar to the one shown in the video. Now, these plans did end up changing quite significantly, but that isn't going to happen until I start working on the bodice, which I have already done. You can see it behind me. But as far as you guys are concerned, that hasn't happened yet. So you can kind of just put that aside for now. But let's get to work on the skirt. Uh, I am using a pattern from Patterns of Time and I'll link the uh, their Etsy store below. I got really, really lucky with this skirt pattern. It fit me almost perfectly. All I really needed to do was lengthen it by about two inches, which I did but the waist fit me exactly. I had to do some very, very small and fiddly adjustments with the gores around the hips, but for the most part, it fit like a glove already, which has never happened to me ever, but especially not with the Patterns of Time patterns because they seldom seem to fit anybody. They're all the idealized Victorian size. <laughs> so I oftentimes have to do a lot of fiddling around with those patterns to get them to fit, but I really didn't have to do anything with this one, which was so lovely. After I'd finished marking out the pattern on the wrong end of the fabric with the friction pen that will disappear in heat, I cut it all out. And of course I repeated the same process for all of the other skirt pattern pieces. So this is what a Victorian skirt looks like when it's been cut out, but not yet sewn together. This is the front, these are the side pieces, and then that's the back. And if it had a train, this would just extend even further backwards. And it looks like this because fabric was much narrower 
in the 1800s. It was not, the, the bolts of fabric were not as wide as they are now. So they had to piece them quite extremely. And I decided to stay true to that for this one, even though I would have still had to have pieced this. This fabric was not as wide as that is there. I would have still had to piece it, but it just would have been further that way. But I just decided to stick with where the, stick with where the pattern was. So that's the back. So that side and that side will be sewn together eventually. And then the waist will be gathered and pleated down. This is where we are so far. It looks very, very <laughs> wrinkled and messy, but it's not gonna, it won't do to just sew this together as it is. It needs a flat lining. Flat linings give the skirt more body. It keeps the fabric from shifting and stretching. So I'm going to cut out the flat lining. And as if by magic, here is the lining all cut out and laid out. So it's now time to start basting the lining to the fashion fabric. I'm, I'm not sure about this part here. I am trying to decide whether I should sew the two lining, these two lining pieces together and do the same with the corresponding fashion fabric pieces and then just sew the big, the two big, like baste the two big pieces together or if I should baste the triangular lining piece to its corresponding fashion fabric piece and this lining piece to its corresponding fashion fabric piece and then sew and then just treat treat those as two different pieces and then sew them together. I think I'm going to baste that to its corresponding fashion piece and that to its corresponding fashion piece and then just sew them together. I think that'll give me more control over the, any rippling and bubbling that might happen. I think if I were to sew these together and then sew the fashion fabric pieces together, there'd be more chance of just there being excess fabric and that getting uh, lost somewhere in translation and causing, and causing bubbles and ripples, which I don't want. Now I know it looks like I got all of the basting done in a matter of 40 seconds, but it actually took several weeks. Several weeks of very, very sore knees because I have still not bought a cushion. But once everything was all basted together, it came the blessed time to pin everything together and later to sew everything together. And this is always the most exciting part of making a skirt for me because this is when it actually starts to look like a skirt and not just some flat pieces of fabric. So I found this thread that matches perfectly, but sadly, they only had the one spool. So I'm gonna have to be careful and sparing with it. It has, how much is there? How much of it is there? Oh, 225 yards. So that's definitely gonna be enough to do everything that I need it to do, but I'm gonna have to be sparing with it. So when I whip my uh, like seam allowances down and stuff, I'm gonna have to use a different color thread.
And now for the all-important ironing. So there we have it. That is, that's clearly a skirt, isn't it? And this is the widest shot that I could get and it's, the skirt is still cut off on the side. So I, there's nothing else I could do. I'm sorry about that. But now comes the time to stitch up the back. So the back is getting stitched up here to the same one on the other side. And it gets stitched up to that point where the uh, piecing meets the other part, this is the slit, the opening slit, so that I can actually get into this. So I'm going to sew it up to there. But of course, before I could sew it up, I had to pin the seam closed first. I was then ready to sew the back seam closed. Also, no more sewing machine ASMR. You've had your fill. After I'd gotten all of the seams sewn up, I had to embark upon the rather odious task of finishing off the raw edges. Now in the Victorian era, they didn't have surging machines. They did have an they did have the overlocker that had been invented, but it was not often used for finishing off raw edges. The most common way for finishing off the raw seams for skirts was to just whip stitch the raw seam down to the interlining. So that's what I did. That just keeps it from fraying. Instead of being shaped by having multiple gourd panels, this skirt has just three panels, which made the uh, that part easier. And it's shaped with darts, and then it's gathered in the back. So I could have just pinned out the darts like it told me to, but I want to actually like fit them on over my bum pad or my hip pad and corset and stuff like that. So I don't have to sew them and then fit them and sew them again. I'm just gonna do this first time. So I've got this all pinned on in the way that it's gonna be inside out. I've pinned just the top of the darts so they are sitting in the correct space. And then I've kind of faux gathered the back. So I'm going to pin these, pin these darts into place. It was then back over to the machine to sew the darts into place. Then it was time to deal with the all-important placket. So I pinned the fashion fabric of the placket to the fashion fabric of the skirt right sides together. I sewed it in place along the pin line and everything was A-OK. -okay. So then it was back over to the ironing board to iron that seam flat and to then iron it over so it would naturally fold over and not create a bulky a bulky layer in the back of the skirt. I naturally had to stitch the lining side of the placket to the lining side of the skirt, so I settled in for some relaxing hand sewing. Now I've done all of the stuff that I said I'd do last time I filmed, in addition to which I've added these little darts at the front. This is not pinned onto Maria, even it's not remotely straight, but it's fine. I did these little darts just to make it fit 
better across the front because it was bunching up here and I didn't like that. And I'm sorry for not getting this process on camera, but it was the inauguration night celebration when I was doing this and I didn't feel like uh, putting America on hold. <laughs> so it's now time to do the waistband. I'm guessing that you're all pretty familiar with my method of cutting out fabric pieces if you've made it this far into the video, so I'm not going to insult your intelligence by explaining it all yet again. Now, the back of this skirt is gathered down, and I have always done uh, pleats for overskirts and then gathers for petticoats, but having actually worn this skirt gathered at the back, I really, really like it. I think that gathering actually gives more fullness than pleating, so I am a convert to gathering now. Having gathered down the back, I then sewed on the waistband. Woohoo! Love this part of the process. At this point, I folded the waistband inward and stitched it by hand to the inside of the skirt. And I tried to get footage of this part, but I only ended up getting footage of my shoulder. So, sorry about that. All right, so the good news is that the waistband fits just how I wanted it to. The bad news is that I made some sort of mistake while sewing this part up, and now there's more fabric here than there is here, which is causing it to hang strangely. So that means that I either have to completely take apart the waistband and uh, refit it, or I need to unpick this seam down here, this back center back seam. And I'm going to do the center back seam because if you look here, the hems, uh, or where the hems will be, don't line up perfectly, so I want to, I'm just going to undo this and make them line up better. This will, however, mean that this chevron place will no longer match up so nicely. This one on the right will be further down, but, you know, nobody's really going to be paying a lot of attention to that seam placement. So I'm going to fix this as if by magic. All right. The back has been fixed and sadly those no longer match up but that's fine who's gonna be i really hope that nobody's examining my backside closely enough to, no to notice that if they do i'll be filing charges so now i'm going to put on some more hooks here here and here just to keep this placket from gaping and also another hook here there so that this part won't be flapping around. I'm also going to move this bar this way a little bit to tighten the waist a little bit. So that's what I'm going to do now. So here's the skirt as we have it now. I'm a little bit miffed because I didn't realize that Maria had kind of shortened a little bit over time. So the skirt is shorter than I wanted it to be um, because when I fitted this, it was trailing on the ground because she was several inches shorter than I am. So I fixed that and now the skirt is, is shorter than I had intended. So that's still going to be fine though. It's just going to have a pretty small hem and this will mean that it won't wear out as quickly as it otherwise would. So irritating, but not the end of the world. So now the time has come to put on the elastic braid. So I'm going to read you the instructions. This is all she wrote. The pattern of the skirt is given in figures 1, 2, and 2A. Join the breadths with corresponding figures meeting. Fit the top hip darts as indicated and gather the back from the star to the slit. The points marked with a star across the back are tacked upon an elastic braid strap five inches long. So when it's talking about the star to the slit, it means that star there to that slit. That's the, that's the opening there and then that's going around to the front so initially i thought that the elastic braid strap just kind of went from that star to there and that would mean that the elastic braid 
would just be directly underneath here. It would just be right here, just kind of holding that in. Because as you can see, there are no other parts of this pattern that are marked star. However, if you look at this little schematic of the pattern here, there are these two little stars, which did not make it onto the big pattern over there. So I think somehow they just kind of got lost in translation. So I think what's supposed to happen is there is supposed to be a five inch a piece of elastic braid going from here to here and then another one on the other side. Just kind of where the gathers are to keep all of the gathers towards the back. So I'm gonna try pinning that into place roughly where it seems to be on here. And I'm gonna see how that looks. So I've got some elastic over here, some elastic, what do they call it? Elastic braid, I've got some elastic braid here. I'm probably gonna use one of these narrower ones. So I'm going to uh, do some experimenting with that and see what they mean. the footage of me sewing on the elastic band got lost at some point and I don't know how that happened so I apologize for that. Because of the mistake that I made with the dress form being too being kind of dropped down when I was uh, measuring out the skirt length I can't afford to have a very deep hem at all because already pretty high off the ground. Oh shoot, the flashlight turned on. Well, it's nighttime because this is the only time I can find a sew. So this is actually probably a good thing. So this is the shortest part and I'm not actually gonna hem this part up at all. This part is just gonna stay like this and it'll be covered over later with a hem facing. So I'm just going to hem everything else to this, uh, to this length because that's as short as I want it to get. gotten the hem tape made and partially stitched on and forgive me for not showing that to you but if I'm being perfectly honest I forgot so this hem braid or hem tape is not 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 historically accurate it's made out of this um most I think it's definitely synthetic uh cotton velveteen it's got this kind of weird uh ribbing or ridge texture to it. You wouldn't have really seen that in the 1800s. They did have cotton velveteen hem bindings in the 1800s, and Editing Me will insert a picture of an advertisement for that, but they would have just been like a... You wouldn't, like, you would have needed to finish the edges or whatever. You could have just bought, like, a cotton velveteen ribbon, but I couldn't find any cotton velveteen ribbons that were, A, wide enough, and B, a good match to this incredibly bizarre it really quite frankly the color of this of this um cotton sateen is incredibly irritating because it's difficult to find anything that matches it um so i just had to make this and no it's not historically accurate but beggars can't be choosers so i stitched it on by machine on the top right here oh and i also stupidly forgot to change my bobbin so half of it is stitched on with this like really ugly yellow thread but luckily you can't really tell from the outside because it's uh, very fluffy. So I stitched it on by machine. On the, oh, for heaven's sake. So I stitch it on by machine like this, and then I'm going to bring it around and fold it up under like this, and then stitch it on on the inside by hand. But I'm not going to do that yet because the skirt is still quite floppy, so it needs a tarlatan layer. For my tarlatan layer, I have this uh, synthetic horsehair, and 
I actually, full disclosure, I thought that uh, in the 1890s, people did put horse hair in the hems of skirts, but I saw Abby Cox's video, I'll link it down below, in which she mentioned that in all of the late 19th century skirts she's examined, not one of them has had horse hair in the hem. But luckily, this is not actually quite the weight of horse hair. This is a kind of lighter than horse hair. And this is about the weight and stiffness of tarlatan. Now, it would be more accurate for me to just get tarlatan and use actual tarlatan, but I have this and I want to use it. So I'm just gonna use this. Also, I feel kind of guilty saying this, but I am kind of scared of tarlatan because it's not a stiff fabric. It's a fabric that has had like glue or starch or something kind of worked into it to stiffen it, but that will wear out over time. And you read references in, in magazines from the 1890s of ripping out and replacing your tarlatan layer after it's gotten soft in your skirt. And that really does not appeal to me. So I feel kind of guilty for using this, but A, I have it around and B, I really don't want to have to rip out my stiffening layer and redo it every six months. So we're doing this. It's going to go in and it will just stay in and next skirt I make will, I'll actually use tarlatan. But for now, we're going with this. So now I need to make the facing that's gonna go over this. I did this by using the hem of the pattern piece as a guide. I then measured two inches down from it since I'd extended the skirt by two inches and a few inches up as well. So I could make a facing piece that was a few inches larger than the stiffening layer so I could be sure that I would have enough to completely cover it. I sewed all of the facing pieces together so that they made a big loop and then went over to the sewing machine and sewed them onto the bottom of the skirt. I then had to fold the top edge of the facing piece over the top of the stiffener and pin it down and then I whip stitched that to place, being very careful not to let my stitches show through to the exterior of the garment. Sometimes with late 19th century skirts you do see stitching lines of where the hem facing and hem stiffener have been affixed. Sometimes you can see the stitching lines all the way through, but I really don't like that look. So I was very fastidious in order to avoid that from happening. footage of the actual whip stitching but it's pretty easy to imagine how I did that so I'm not all that upset about not getting footage of that. So the skirt is now done but I'm not going to have any vanity footage in this video. I've tried to wear this skirt just with a shirt waist but it just doesn't really work just with a shirt waist without its, without its bodice and the bodice is not finished yet obviously. Um, the front, in spite of those two little darts that I added in the front, the front still kind of wants to pucker up without a bodice over it to keep it down. So yeah, it's just doesn't look very good without, without a bodice over it. So you're going to have to wait a little while for the vanity footage and to see how the skirt looks finished, but, uh, I'm sure that you can, you can do that. You can be patient. I believe in you all. <laughs> so a huge thank you to Sandra White, Mary Royal, and Kit Kat Stitch for sponsoring this channel on Patreon. And Emily Donnelly, who became a patron after I'd shot that footage. So thank you so much, Emily. If you would also like to sponsor the channel on Patreon, I will leave a link down below. No pressure if you can't. There will also be a link to my Instagram if you want to follow me there. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, notification bell, 
and I'm sure I've forgotten something. Um, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.